Um, so this morning, we're, we're going to start a new series called Passion. Passion. Um, in, in what this next few weeks, so we got four weeks leading up into and through Easter, where we're going to go over the last uh, week of Jesus's life. So it's called Passion Week. So that last week of Jesus's life, from Sunday to his crucifixion on Friday, uh, starts with Palm Sunday and it ends with the resurrection a week later um, uh, on, on Easter Sunday. So what we're gonna do, there's seven days that we're gonna kinda go over over these next few, uh, these next few weeks. But how, do you, how many of you know, if we're gonna go through seven days but we have four weeks, that math doesn't really work, right? <laughs> Sorry. This is kind of, we're going to make it work, all right? Uh, so we've got, uh, we've got a, a few weeks here that we're going to just go through some of the events um, that we've got, uh, that, that were, um, um, that happened throughout that week. So I want to just give you guys some information to kind of set the stage, and then we're going to jump into here. Uh, so in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, those are called the four gospels, Okay. Um, so it's four different accounts, four different perspectives, in a sense, of, of the same information. It's Jesus' life. But I want to give you some statistics. So in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, there's 89 chapters between those four Gospels. This is a great time, if you have your pen and your paper, to get them out and to, uh, and to take some notes. So 89 chapters between the four gospels. There's four, four of those chapters are on the first 30 years of Jesus's life. Four. 85 chapters from those four gospels are on the last three and a half years of Jesus's life. And of those 89 chapters, 29 of them deal with Passion Week this last week of Jesus' life. So it's pretty significant. Uh, th what I found was very interesting, almost half of the book of John, so Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, half of that book has to do with Passion Week, with that last week of Jesus' life. So we're going to try to go through some of those events. Um, I want to give you kind of an outline of what happened in that final week. So Sunday, not today, but in a couple weeks, uh, April 2nd is when we'll celebrate what's called Palm Sunday. It's also called the triumphal entry. So this is when Jesus rode into the temple on a donkey, which we're gonna read about in a second. But that happened on Sunday. On Monday is when Jesus went, went and cleared the temple. They were changing, uh, uh, money changers were in the, in the temple, and, uh, and he goes and he clears it out. Um, Tuesday, is, there's a lot of teaching that happened on Tuesday. This is when Jesus is teaching on the Mount of Olives. Wednesday is when we see that Jesus rested in Bethany. It's also when Judas begins to betray Jesus. On Thursday is the Last Supper, it's also, so that's the, we call that communion, but that's when Jesus had communion with the, with the disciples. It's also when Jesus prayed in the garden, the garden of Gethsemane. Father, not my will be done, but yours. Friday was the crucifixion. Saturday, Jesus is in the grave. And Sunday is Resurrection Sunday. And that's what we're gonna do on Easter. We're gonna celebrate that resurrection. And this one's going to get changed, that's for sure. <laughs> um, so my hope over this next four weeks and, and starting today, my hope as your pastor is that as we study this, that I'm stirring up a deeper passion in your heart for Jesus Christ. Right. Because how many of you know Jesus' passion? I, I believe that our passion should match the passion of Christ. And what did Jesus give? Everything. 
our passion. We should have such a burning desire to follow Christ with every fiber, fiber of our being. And I'm hoping to stir that up. And I, how, how many of you really know that man can't stir that up? I might be able to kind of spark something, but the Holy Spirit is the one that's going to stir it up. So get ready. Amen? Yeah. Well, let's start with what is Jesus' passion? Well, I believe that if you were to take your cell phone out and you get that camera and make sure that it's not pointing out, but it's pointing at you so you get a good look at your face, that's Jesus' passion. Yes. And if I can come away with one thing to communicate how much Jesus loves you, then I feel like I have successfully honored him. He loves you. In fact, John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Right. Romans 5.8, which is one of my all-time favorite scriptures, says, But God demonstrated his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He did not wait for you to fix yourself. He did not wait for you to be perfect before he would love you. He went and he paid that price for you. And I want you to just start to, just start to, to chew on that. Just start to, to meditate on that, what that actually means. That while you were still sinners... Christ died for you because he loves you that much. Yes. So let's jump in. We're going to go to Matthew 21, verses 1 through 11. This is called the triumphal entry. So we're going to talk about Palm Sunday. Okay, we're going to talk about the triumphal entry. But again, that didn't happen today historically. It would have been in a couple weeks. So... But what this says, the triumphal entry, so let's start reading verse 1. I'm reading through the New King James. That's what's on the screen. Yours might word it a little different if you're reading from the NIV or some other translation. But uh, the, the verse 1 says, Now when they drew near Jerusalem and came to Bethphage at the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village opposite you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Loose them and bring them to me. And if anyone says anything to you, you shall say, the Lord has need of them, and immediately he will send them. Well, let, me, let me stop for just a second. So Jesus says to these two, he says, now I need you, these two disciples, I need you to go into the, the village opposite or to the city opposite. There you're going to find a colt. You're going to find it tied up, and I need you to untie it, and I need you to bring it to me. Jesus knows the finest details of your life. If he knows where a colt is tied and that you need to go get it, you're going to find it here. Go get it and then bring it back to me. He knows everything that is going on in your life. So that should immediately, I want that to bring you peace. Knowing that God knows. You're not standing there or sitting there alone thinking, does God have any clue what's going on in my life? I'm here to tell you today, he does. He knows it all. Verse 4. All this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet, saying, Tell the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you lowly and sitting on a donkey, a colt, the full of a donkey. So the disciples went and did as Jesus commanded. They brought the donkey and the colt and laid their clothes on them and set him on them. Verse 8, And a very great multitude spread their clothes on the road. Others cut down branches from trees and spread them on the road. Then the multitude who went before him and those who followed cried out, saying, Hosanna to the son of David. 
Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when he had come into Jerusalem, all the city was moved, saying, Who is this? So the multitude said, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth of Galilee. So these, this, this scripture here, there's part of it that is a fulfillment of prophecy. So uh, 500 years before this event takes place, more than 500 years, there was a prophet by the name of Zechariah. He prophesied this exact thing. In, in, in fact, Zechariah, uh, Zechariah 9, 9 says this. It says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just in having salvation. Lowly in riding on a donkey, a colt, the full of a donkey. So 500 years before this event, it's prophesied that Jesus is going to come. The Messiah is going to come riding a donkey. And as Jesus strolls into the temple, riding on the back of this donkey, he is fulfilling prophecy. He is fulfilling an event. How, how many of you know if I say something's going to happen in 500 years from now, it's fulfilled? That's pretty amazing. But how many of you know that I'm not going to be here to know if it's fulfilled or not? Right? Well, it's interesting, and I, I, I had some pictures I was going to say at the show, but I'm just going to say it. As Jesus is riding this donkey into the temple, he passes a tomb. Any guess whose tomb it was? Zacharias. Literally, Jesus fulfills prophecy as he's riding by. I, I just imagine Jesus waving, you got this one right, Zechariah. I got this from here, you know? Like it's just, I, I just love to envision what the scriptures are actually doing. And to know that Jesus literally rode on a donkey past the tomb of the one who prophesied it, I think is pretty cool. In fact, 300, probably more than 300 times, this type of thing happened. Jesus fulfilled over 300 prophecies proving he was the Messiah. He was the one that the people were looking for. He was the one who was going to save Israel. And you. And me. I love how prophecy being fulfilled shows God's faithfulness. It shows me there's something about this story that I can now start to lean in and trust. Let's keep going. So let's talk about what the people were crying out. So in verse 9, the people are crying out, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Well, Hosanna in Hebrew means Yashana. I think we've got it up here. Yashana, save now or victory now. So the, Jesus is coming in on a donkey. He, the, the people are laying their clothes down. They're, they're getting palm branches or branches and they're putting it on the ground almost to create a, a runway or a carpet for royalty. See, this would happen when, when a king would come into town. The, the people would lay their clothes down. They would put palm branches down, but the king would be riding on a stallion. There'd be pomp and circumstance. Not a donkey. Zechariah didn't, didn't prophesy a horse or a stallion. He prophesied a humble donkey, colt. Jesus, Jesus didn't come like you think he would come. He came humble as a baby. Yashana, save now. It's taken from Psalms 118, 24, and 26. It says, this is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Save now, I pray, O Lord, 
Oh Lord, I pray, send now prosperity or success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We have blessed you from the house of the Lord. So let's, let's break this up just a little bit. So Yasha now means save now, victory now. But Yasha, I'm going to break this up into the two, two words. Yasha, here's some words that that means. Victory, to be saved, avenging, defend, deliver, help. Persevere, rescue, be safe, bring salvation, save, get victory, health, freedom. Nah, now. Bring it now. Yeah. Not later, bring it now. They're, they're, they're watching Jesus come through. They're seeing him as a Messiah or a, uh, as a king. They're seeing him as a king that's going to come forth and he's going to rescue them from Rome, from Roman control. So they're all cheering. Yeah, Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. They're excited. These same people are shouting crucify him six days later, five days later. Jesus has come to save. They, they were expecting a king that would deliver them immediately. Jesus is here to do much more than what they expected. But they were focused on immediate, immediate gratification. I don't know if that's really the word I want to say but they're looking for answers to an immediate problem. Jesus was going to save them, but far beyond anything that was just applied to this earth. It affected them now, but it was also setting up an eternal kingdom, a salvation that will never end. That wasn't based off of circumstances. It was based off of the authority and the sovereignty of God. The people were praising and were proclaiming Jesus Christ has come and he was the king they were looking for. In, in Luke 19, 39 through 40, this isn't gonna be on the screen. It's, this, it's Luke's version or his perspective of this same event. But I love how this says, it says, and some of the Pharisees called to him from the crowd Teacher, rebuke your disciples. But he answered and said to them, I tell you that if these should keep silent, the stones would immediately cry out. <laughs> the Pharisees, the religious people. Teacher, rebuke your disciples. Their, their praise is a little too loud. <laughs> their praise is a little radical. Their praise is a little fanatical. I believe our passion should match the passion of Christ. That's right. I'm unapologetically going to tell you that all throughout this word, and if you want to go do some word studies in the, in the book of Psalms, go to Psalms 50. Praise was ridiculous. <laughs> it was loud it was joyful. It was exciting. In fact, it even says, um, uh, oh, I don't have it. I, I changed my notes here. Huh. Well, I'll, I'll, get, I'll get there in just a second. Um, it, it was, it was these, these people were enthusiastically praising God. Enthusiastically. Well... That's not how I praise God. Listen, I totally get it. There have been times where I have been in very charismatic experiences. That means um, uh, lots going on, okay? Lots of jumping around and things like that. It was, it, it's, it's been amazing. 
and some of it's been interesting. <laughs> I'll just leave it at that. There's been times where I've preached at churches and I've sat on the, that, that sing hymns and I've sat on the front row and I have just cried because of God's presence. I'm not saying 100% of the time you're jumping up and down or you're excitingly worshiping. But I'm also saying there's never a time. I ask that the Holy Spirit will move in you, that your praise will be amazing. That you'll experience the presence of God in tremendous ways. The purpose of this message is not that we will have lively praise and worship. It's that we will have a room filled with worshipers. There is a battle today for our worship. The devil tempted Jesus in the wilderness regarding worship, and he is still doing it today. Bow down and worship me, the devil said, and Jesus said, you shall worship only one. Worry and stress, distractions, time, money, affections, obsessions. These are all things that come in the way from our worship. The people worshiping Christ one week are shouting crucify him the next. If we're not careful, we will allow worry and stress and distractions and time and money and these things to take the place of the one we worship. We tend to want to go from mountaintop to mountaintop understanding that God is in the valleys too. I don't have to run to this conference, to that conference, to this conference, to that conference in order to find God. He's in your secret place. What's that secret place? That's when you're sitting in your, in your, your, your comfy chair in your, in your living room and you're just listening to worship music. You're just praying and God is filling that room and he's filling your heart with joy. He's filling your heart with, with just gratefulness for all that he has done. There is a battle for our worship. I want to be a passionate pursuer of Jesus, not a fickle follower. Follower. We're all worshiping something. See, it's not, it's not the problem that I love something. It's that I love something and it begins to take the place of Jesus. That's, that's the problem. I wrote, I wrote this down. Uh, in, in Mark 12, 29 through 30, I love it. It says this is the number one thing that Jesus wants. It says the most important one, the most important commandment, it says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. Everything that was in you, love God with it. Everything. Yes. Worship is our response to what we value most. What I worship becomes an obsession. Whatever I become obsessed with, I imitate. And whatever I imitate, I become. Jack Hayford said this, my worship changes, or worship changes the worshiper into the image of the one worshiped. What are you worshiping? What's getting your time? What's getting all your affections? What's getting your money? What, what is it? And if it's not God, then it's an idol and you're worshiping something else. I want to get ready to, to close here in just a second. There is a, uh, the United States Marine Corps has a, a base in, in Cherry Point, North Carolina. Camp Lejeune, I believe it is. And it's located near an, an interstate. So what they would do is they, they it's an air base and they would fly, they do, they fly fighter jets. Okay? And so these these fighter jets that are going all over the place and doing maneuvers, they create quite a noise. 
quite a maybe disturbance or a rumble. <laughs> they, go, they would go over the highway and there began to be accidents. So the military base put up a sign. Pardon our noise. It's the sound of freedom. Your worship can get loud. Jesus, if he has changed your life, see what, I think what happens sometimes is we become so sophisticated that we forget what Jesus has saved us from. Right. And I'm not, I'm not coming down hard on you. I'm, I'm trying to pull you along. That there's times in my life I've, I've been told, you need to calm down. But when you realize what Jesus has done in your life, what I realize that Jesus has done in my life, it creates a praise. It begins to create a sound or a noise. And I just have to say, pardon my noise, but that's the sound of freedom. Jesus has changed me. Has Jesus changed you? If he has, it's okay to worship him. He kind of wants that. But give him everything you got. Uh, your mind, your will, your emotions, your strength, your soul, your plans, your family, your work. Give it all to him. That's right. I love it. I, say, I, I wrote down, he picked me up, he turned me around, he placed my feet on solid ground. I thank the master. I thank the Savior. I thank God. Psalms 47, 1 and 2 says, Clap your hands, all you nations. Shout to God with cries of joy. For the Lord Most High is awesome, the great King over all the earth. You know, I, as I was reading this, this passage, it's good to read the same things over and over. Because something struck me that hasn't struck me before. In Matthew 21, 10, it says, and when he, Jesus, when he had come into Jerusalem, all the city was moved saying, who is this? And that, triggered something that, that, that ministered to me. All the city was moved. Like thunder jets flying over an interstate and shaking the ground, Jesus coming into a city shook the ground. It, that, that word literally can mean earthquake. The city was moved. People noticed that something was different. Has God moved you? Has God come into your life and moved you? Has he, has he shook the ground you stand on? To where you stand in awe of who he is? See, when Jesus comes into a city, a church, a home, or a life, he affects the area. He's not just looking to move you emotionally, but he give you a life and a life more abundantly. We all worship something. And at the very center of every heart is the question, what or who am I worshiping? So I wanna move into a time of prayer. If you bow your heads, close your eyes. I want you to answer that question, what or whom am I worshiping? And if it's anything or anyone other than Jesus, guys, our priorities are, are out of line. You could be worshiping your career or your degree or even your church. 
It could be your finances or your comfort or a whole host of other things. If you find that something is out of place, I want you to talk to Jesus about it. Tell Jesus, he already already knows, but tell him. Confess it, that's called confession. But there is one question that every heart has to have answered. And that question is, is my heart right with God? See, remember, you are Jesus' passion. You are the reason that he went to the cross. It was for your sins and mine that Jesus died on the cross. You may think that my heart is right, or I hope it's right. You may say, I try hard to be a good person. But trying harder does not make you right with God. Trying to be perfect does not make you right with God. The Bible says in Romans, all who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And that is exactly what we're going to do right now. This is a defining moment for you. If you want to ask Jesus into your heart, if you want to give him everything, if you want to surrender your life to him, or maybe you've been away from God and you want to come back to him, then today is the day. On the count of three, I'm going to ask that you will raise your hand. We're going to pray. And if you want to be included in that prayer, if you want to ask Jesus to come into your life today, I'm going to ask that right now you will slip up your hand. One, two, three. Raise your hand. I see that hand. I see those hands. Three of them right back there. Anybody else? Anybody else? Yep. Good. Amen. Anybody else? Today, you want to call on the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, Romans 10, 9 says that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and if you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, it says you will be saved. It's a beautiful promise. And we're gonna do that right now. So with every head bowed, every eye closed, church, will you pray this along with those who raise their hand? Say, dear Heavenly Father, I come to you in Jesus' name. I believe Jesus died on the cross. That he rose again. And he's seated on the throne. Father, forgive me for all that I've done wrong. And I choose to forgive all others. Come into my heart. Today and forever, I am yours. In Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah.